Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jen Chonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. Um, really happy to be back today with Oswin Latimer, uh, autistic consultant, and we're going to be talking about attachment, bonding, and trust, and the missing components in modern autism practice. So Oswin is a lifelong advocate for practices and policies of issues of importance to autistic people. As a recognized expert and leader in FAIR field, FAIR works to empower people to have a voice in the direction and quality of their lives. FAIR experience in leadership, educating, research, and public advocacy for issues surrounding autistic people have made them a highly respected consultant, public speaker, and presenter both nationally and locally. Oswin is the founder and president of Foundations for Divergent Minds and former director of community engagement for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Faye have served as a consultant on policy discussion to the U.S. Department of Labor, Department of Education, and Department of Personnel Management. Faye are also a valued consultant to many parents, offering useful and practical advice on how to organize their homes and create individualized education plans that best meet the needs of their child. Um, we will link to Foundations for Divergent Minds for anyone who would like to look into them more and see what they offer. Um, and I wanted to note that we'll be having four, of, four members of their leadership back in April, including Osman, of course. Um, as always, we love to hear more about you. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to let us know a little about yourself in the chat. Um, and please give this video a thumbs up if you find it helpful. It definitely helps um, with YouTube's algorithm. Um, so today's format is going to be uh, inter interview style and Oswin would love to answer your questions. Um, and we're going to see how the chat goes. If, if uh, we have a lot of um, conversation in the chat, I may I may ask you guys to give me uh, like a certain word so that I can better track your questions, but we'll see how we do. And then we can always uh, implement that later. <laughs> so first, welcome back, Osman. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling up the questions over on the sides, but I can't remember what we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> before it comes. <laughs> um, All right, I, I'll, I, I can start with um, the first, question if you'd like. Yes. yes. Okay. So um, you have talked a lot about the current trends in autism treatment and how the emphasis is on skill acquisition instead of focusing on secure attachment. So do you want to first introduce us to that and why do you think that is? Okay. So um, I guess we first need to define what secure attachment is, um, because I think that it's something that we don't really think about very much with autistic kids, period. Um, and that's because there, with this heavy emphasis on early intervention, it is literally meant to, okay, if we divide it, if we divide up quality of life when somebody gets to adulthood, then there are certain measures that are objective and certain measures that are subjective and the objective measures are typically what we try to teach because we think if we can do this and then this person can be self-sufficient ignoring of course that the subjective is a little bit more about what we end up feeling ourselves so so we see a lot of this well we want to make sure somebody's able to maintain their hygiene we want to make sure that people are able to maintain their household. Um, if we can, we would like people to be able to get a job and learn how to get to and from that job. Um, or at least be able to access like a day program. And these are the end goals that people have for autistic kids. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're not contributing, then, I mean, it's eugenics of not thinking that if somebody's, if somebody's not contributing, then they're not good for society. Yeah. Um, and so there's this high emphasis on these skills that we can objectively measure to show that, hey, this person can do all the things that we 
want them to do um, to show that they're worthy of living, which is, I really hate saying that out loud, but like, if we don't say the, the silent parts out loud, then nobody will ever address them. Um, uh, so, but I don't, I think that anybody that's listening, uh, whether or not you care about neurodiversity, whether or not you care about any of these things, even if you're just here to like, ignore everything I'm about to say, then you can agree that being able to do your hygiene, eat, and do your chores at home is not really a quality life. Like nobody would consider that for themselves to be a quality life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's like the bare minimum of surviving life. And like, there's a reason that we end up with these really terrible mental health outcomes for autistic people as adults is because we're setting people up to survive and not to be able to engage with friends in an authentic way. And, uh, so, and let's be real, the objective skills are easier to teach. Yeah. Um, they're kind of the low hanging fruit of growth from childhood to adulthood. Um, and so it's easy, and it's easier to teach these things in uh, a behaviorist way than some of those little bit more subjective things that um, have to do with being able to set your own goals and being able to have your own relationships and all these things, which are um, kind of the antithesis of what we end up getting with uh, with autism service equity, um, services. Uh, so uh, when we get into attachment, we get we get deeper into this understanding of like. Uh, what it means to have those good relationships in adulthood and but that starts out when kids are infants <laughs> uh like yeah. the attachment that we get and i know we're going to do a video on that here in just a second but like so secure attachment is are are happy you're you feel safe you feel safe going to the people around you you feel safe speaking up mm -hmm. you feel safe um you trust the people that you are, or for children, especially you trust the people, the adults around you to be able to meet your needs. And if we don't have that, then, um, then we end up with these um, insecure attachment styles um, that lead into a lot of um, the quote unquote maladaptive behaviors. Yeah. Um, because we don't have the feeling like we can get our needs met. And research actually shows that attachment in autistic kids, like 50% of kids have an insecure attachment um, before we ever do any therapies. <laughs> yeah. Like and this is- Do you yeah. think, so is part of that the way um, autism is presented like in the DSM as um, being very different. So parents find out, you know, that their child is autistic, say it's a neurotypical parent and it's an autistic child. So two neurotypes who, you know, would have to work a little bit more to communicate, which again, the burden should be on, you know, the adult. <laughs> Yes. And the person, you know, the neurotypical person who's in the majority. Um, but do you, do you think that that contributes to this um, unsecure attachment? Like just the difference in those styles and then like the narrative that goes along with diagnosis. Yes. And if we can put this link that we I prepared for the, yeah. the, the paper that we, so everyone got up in arms about this last year because of the way it was reported, but there's this um, paper that came out that was um, using a preemptive intervention um, and that this, this intervention uh, caused a reduction in diagnosis of at-risk infants by age three of a um, 
statistically significant amount. Mm -hmm. um, and now people didn't like it because it said, hey, it's making kids not be autistic. And I don't think that's actually what occurred there. Um, when we get into the actual paper, it shows that um, there's a subset of kids that still um, have rigid interests <laughs> and have rigidity. Um, i.e. they're still autistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're just not um, showing all the other signs of being autistic. Uh, specifically, they have good joint attention skills and they have more imaginative play. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're children. <laughs> and so uh, what we need to know about this study and this intervention is that it was intentionally created to improve the attachment styles between parents and their autistic children. Like that's what that intervention was made to do. Um, they used it preemptively with at-risk infants just to see like what would happen. And what right. happened was a reduction in, in diagnosis. Does not mean those kids were autistic. They just didn't get diagnosed at three because we have all these measures now that say, hey, this is what an autistic person looks like. No, that's what a traumatized autistic child looks like. Yeah. Um, when you're not, then you end up being able to have that social engagement a little bit more. And you, and like, the communication outcomes are there as well. Like we end up seeing better communication from just increasing the attachment between parent and child. And so like we now have at least one method that is impaired, that is empirical evidence that if we can get a, um, a match between the ways that parents are responding to their um, young children. Right. That it automatically makes social skills not something that you have to innately teach because that child is now feeling secure in that relationship with their parent yeah. just by being understood and it uh for people that don't know what this ended up looking like it the method went through and uh re video recorded the sessions um uh, play sessions between the parent and the child and then they would take that and go into this um session with this interventionist um the the parent would and the uh, interventionist would explain to the parent like what they saw in terms of the child's, um, what the child was communicating with their body language and all these things. And then the parent would go back and take what they learned to be able to engage with their child the way that that child was engaging instead of having that mismatch um, that can occur if your parent doesn't know what's going on with, your, with the way that you're playing. And uh, this went over the course of like six weeks of them fine tuning this until, hey, we see this great progress with the child. And like, uh, there's some other studies that use the same methods with some uh, with children that were already diagnosed and how that ends up, again, improving the joint attention, improving all these social um, measures that we're told autistic kids can't do. Well, it turns out autistic kids can do that if they are understood and they feel safe in their environment. Right. So, and so the foundation of that really is um, that safety and whether or not they their stress is elevated due to their needs not being met or understood. Yes. Right. So, and, and, you know, we put so much emphasis on this for neurotypical children, you yeah. know, we, we all seem to be, well, at least in the, in the non-autistic world, there's so much talk about, you know, creating these healthy, secure attachments early in life, being responsive to children. Granted, there's, there's also, you know, a push to make them independent sooner than developmentally appropriate, you know, so, so there's varying um, <laughs> levels of this everywhere, but it is especially concentrated when it comes to autistic kids, precisely because of the way we view a diagnosis and what we then do with that information. Absolutely. And, uh, I think this is why you end up seeing, uh, why we're seeing more and more parents rejecting, um, ABA therapies and such is because 
there's this really big push for gentle parenting and peaceful parenting and attachment parenting styles that are really meant to honor a child. And then you look at ABA, it's like, this is not anything right. close to like my values of parenting. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, we, and I think it's why we get into a lot of parents um, just struggling to match what uh, educators and clinicians are telling them to do just because this does not match with what we know. And while their kids may still be having a lot of behavioral problems and may still be having a lot of troubles with connecting and feeling secure and attached, at least that parent can usually see that that's going on even if they don't know why it's happening. Right. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Do you think this might be a good time to show our first yes. video? Yes. Okay. So I'll just quickly introduce this, that um, this study was called the still face experiment. Um, distinguished professor, Dr. Edward Tronick, who's a developmental psychologist, best known for his studies on infants, um, introduces this scenario where um, there is a baby with her mother um, and um, I think that this is a really great lesson for all of us. So Joe, if you would play our video and then we'll be right back with Oswin to comment. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my girl. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother, she points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good there's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Okay, so I find that 
hard to watch. Yes. Um, and if you think about uh, the way that we do this at such high concentrations to autistic children, whether through planned ignoring or through, um, you know, not not answering to uh, a str uh, <laughs> distress. Like, yes, not answering to distress unless it's done in a way that we want them to do it, or you know, in a asking in a way that we're requiring them to do it. I mean, the amount you can see the amount of stress that that caused that baby to not be responded to. And there have been more and more studies that have used still face and like this is, a, uh, I think the, the video is very, I think whenever you watch the video of it and I do every so often just to like, remember that mm -hmm. feeling <laughs> um, because it's important to me to make sure I'm not conveying or that I'm conveying enough emotion with but when I'm talking about it, if people aren't seeing it. Uh, but we, but the, the science has gone further than just showing that visible distress. They, there's now measures of like cortisol and, and, and just how um, detrimental it is to kids. And then uh, some of the ones that look at the cortisol levels already can show kids that are already developing that um, insecure attachment because their their cortisol levels don't go back to normal fast enough mm. and so if we take that into three-year-olds where we're maybe not even seeing the same level of distress of that ignoring um because you kind of get used to not having to respond right and just knowing that you have to do it deal with it internally um it's really it's really scary to think about how much kids or autistic kids specifically learn that they can't show that distress right. and how quickly it happens. Um, there is actually a study, uh, a, a modified still face study for autistic kids around the age of two that are non-speaking that was done in the early 2000s, the early aughts. There we go. I like using aughts. <laughs> um, and uh, it looked at non-speaking children that didn't natural or that didn't normally engage in in play with another person, and they brought in a uh, a therapist into the environment with the kid, and they did some parallel play with the autistic kid, and the autistic kid did not show any joint attention, and uh, kind of more or less ignored that other human being. Mm -hmm they thought um, when they came back for the second session and that person intentionally ignored the child you end up seeing the same exact things that you saw in this video but with these non-speaking two to three year olds wow and so um just by not parallel plank so on the second encounter with a with a stranger <laughs> wow so this gets to the heart of um, the way that autistic sociality and communication has been misunderstood. And, you know, based on the diagnosis and the criteria and, you know, historical autism research that, you know, places deficits if you do not communicate or socialize in a neurotypical way. Um, it's really led people down this path of thinking that if it's not done in a neurotypical way, it's not done or it's not I, there. Um, and this is how like people started being surprised in the um, 20 teens um, that research was showing that autistic people wanted to have friends. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Just because you can't get them doesn't mean you don't want them. And now, yes, some people end up getting to that point of not wanting to have friends because like those relationships have ended up being so traumatizing that why would you want to be friends with anyone? Right. But that's not the same thing as not actually wanting that connection 
It's just right. knowing it's not safe anymore. Right. That's a means of self-preservation. Yeah. And so uh, this very, very much uh, pathologizing the way that autistic people engage socially. And it's why it's so important to look at the attachment part, because like if we're if we're seeing that this is all occurring within or if we're, we're using attachment research to see these things with with the still face, we we're using the attachment um, in order to make this this intervention to try and increase social ability. Right. Um, there's other implications to that, though, it, it ha that then gives more space for for co-regulation and self-regulation skills because you know that your that your environment is trusted right um that you know you're going to have your needs met it may take a bit to like get it communicated but that by itself has so much impact on everything <laughs> literally everything um, and this gets even more into then how we end up seeing um, um, what happens when we start removing these things um, so I'm going to get in can we go ahead and move to question three yes and then um, I thought we would go ahead and start the video now but I think we can do I want to explain something before we do and so I will I will cue for it instead. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, you're good. So the so this question that we were going to move to next was about how do how do traditional behaviorist methods affect attachment? And I'll say just this disclaimer that this doesn't exclusively mean ABA, but anything that is using compliance based or behaviorist based approaches. What, even if it's a, more of a so-called developmental therapy, if it is using uh, compliance-based and rewards and consequences, um, it can also lead to similar problems. Um, and I'm going to piggyback on your disclaimer there and make it clear: make it clear that this can happen in an OT session. This can happen in a speech session. This is. Um, EIBI, um, early intervention behavior, or early, early uh, intensive what, behavior. Intensive, thank you. <laughs> intensive <laughs> behavioral interventions. Um, this is your uh, positive behavior interventions and supports within uh, K or well pre K through twelve education. Um, this happens across um, everything, and so uh, while we can talk about it in terms of like the hardcore doing it in a clinical setting where it's 40 hours a week of this. Um, mm -hmm. It is also happening most likely at every stage of an autistic person's life because these are what is considered evidence-based practices. Right. And so evidence-based practices are going to be in literally everything and structured in everything unless you are seeking people out that intentionally don't do these methods. Um, and so when we look at ABA, um, we're going to, I'm going to go through and I've got a visual here for me to, to reference. So I'm going to be reading off the screen when you're, so that's why I'm not looking. <laughs> um, and it is a image I'm using to, to talk about attachment styles. And so we have, um, we've got secure attachment, we've, but we've got three others. We've got avoidant attachment, ambivalent attachment, and disorganized attachment. And so avoidant attachment is not very explorative, emotionally distant, um, really anxious. Um, and you start to kind of hear this and hear, oh, these autistic symptoms. No, trauma symptoms. Let's reframe it. Um, and so what we end up seeing is this, um, the caretaker is usually distant and disengaged. And that's what causes this avoidant style is because we aren't believing that we're going to get our needs met. And so if we think about this in terms of planned ignoring, mm -hmm. yeah. if we think about this in terms of using hand over hand when somebody's distressed, when we think about all these things where it, 
by design, we, um, these interventions are taught to not engage, not engage with the behavior and not, but that's not engaging with the child's communication. And so this is why we end up with these really anxious autistic children. <laughs> um, it's because by design, we are trying to take the emotions out of it and just get the compliance. This is how we get the lack of exploration. Like that is exactly what is supposed to happen. Which is really, really hard to say. Yeah. Um, give me a second to like process those emotions. Yeah. Um, all right. So next we have the ambivalent attachment style. Um, this is this is also anxious. This is insecure. This gets angry. This is what it looks like in a child. And what we see is inconsistent. Sometimes you're just um, since there's sometimes you're um, negligent. And this is another element of behaviorist practice. Um, this is our intermittent reinforcement. Mm. Can, this you, this. can you just clarify? Because some people might not know what that is. Um, intermittent. I will okay. when we get to the video. Okay. Because okay. the video shows it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, this is giving praise sometimes and not and withholding praise sometimes. Okay. Um, this is all of those things that, um, what we end up getting is that the child doesn't get to the point of not knowing if their needs are going to be met. They know it will be met sometimes. Mm -hmm but they can't judge when it is and how harmful that is to, and how it ends up creating this angry and um, anxious child as well. Um, and then we have this organized attachment. Um, this is depressed, angry, passive, non-responsive. And um, this, um, and, and the caregiver it's um, extreme reactions. Uh, it's um, being frightening or frightened. It's being passive or, or intrusive. Um, so uh, you end up getting uh, very confused on whether or not your needs are going to be met instead of just like um, not sure if they're going to be met. Right. Um, and this is when we, uh, these are, are some of the uh, old ABA methods. Uh, this is why, this is how BCBAs and educators and everything can say, but it's not like old ABA. Right. No, we're not screaming in a child's face. And if nobody knows what I'm referencing there, uh, Lovos had like a whole spread in a magazine that was about, that showed him screaming and slapping children to get uh, the behavioral response that, that he was expecting. Right. Um, so like, this is extreme, this is erratic, this is Judge Rottenberg Center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that leads to depression and anger and, and all these things that, <laughs> because when you show distress, you don't know what's going to happen next. Would this also be part of restraint and seclusion that happens at schools? Yes. And so, uh, especially restraint, um, not, maybe not so much the seclusion part if like, if you're not physically engaging, then we can get back into that kind of avoidant. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on if the door is locked. Right. Right. <laughs> um, like, uh, it's the door open and being ignored versus the door is locked and I can't escape. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the level of fear 
changes in that exactly. scenario. Um, can I ask you a question that we have from the chat? Yes. So they say, um, so what do we do if this is the standard approach in school-based programs? How do we counter them at home? It seems none of the educators that need to hear these seminars attend them. Is countering them at home something that can be effective for the child? Yes, because then all they learn is that some people are safe and some people aren't. And it takes a long time for that to develop. It can take like until they're 20 years old before they can really distinguish like, these are the people that were safe. These were the right. people that were dangerous. <laughs> but that can eventually occur if you are using those standards at home. Now, I will also say that, um, uh, like I was telling Jen before, you can um, get things like collaborative and proactive solutions training for your kids' staff because it is an evidence-based practice mm -hmm. and it does not use these methods. Right. And there is specific training to implement in a PBIS system. Right. And that is, um, it's like written into law, I think about and like FBAs are part of the law, I think. But um, that particular program is compatible and can be used as an alternative. So there are options. It's just, unfortunately, it's on the parent to push for them. Yeah. All right, uh, let's go ahead and do the video. And um, before we do, uh, I am going to put a, I, I want to have a trigger warning here. This is a reenactment of an ABA session. So if you are autistic um, and have experienced ABA, you may not want to watch this. Um, it is a minute and 36 seconds long, I believe. So if you want to like disappear, for a minute and a half, it's cool. Um, but I want to make sure that that's something you're aware of before we play it. Okay. Hi, Mary. Mary, hi. Here. We're going to play with some toys today, okay? Look at all of these toys. What toy would you like to play with? Do you want to play with the puppets? Okay, nice job letting me know. What puppet would you like to play with? Okay, you want to play with the frog? With the frog? Good job. What color is it? Green. Green, it is green. Can you say green frog? Green frog. Nice job. Here you go. Okay, I'm going to play with the yellow duck. This is fun. Hey, look. What is the duck doing? Eat. You're right. The duck is eating. Hey, what is your frog doing? Goldfish. Would you like a goldfish? Okay, nice job telling me. Say goldfish, please. Goldfish, please. Good job. Okay, so it was intentionally really short. I can't, I can't tolerate much more. Hey, if you're in Mercer pages. County and you have a pain that you're- Whoops, that was my <laughs> YouTube, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, like, it's so fake, first off, like uh, we see it and it's fake, but there's a lot of things going on in this video that uh, one, I wanna make a point to show that uh, this video very clearly shows a child that has been in ABA for at least a year. And PRT is a form of ABA, but it was also developed by an SLP. So like SLPs use it too. Um, this is where we get into not all behaviorism is ABA, <laughs> uh, but PRT is the most widely used form of ABA. And this is what people are talking about when they say 
new ABA. Right. Um, but you can tell that the, the child has been in ABA for a while because she knows to get back into a ready position before the person in front of her engages. Um, this happens, I think um, it was about 30 seconds into the video where um, the, the girl um, is, uh, oh, I remember it was with the goldfish. Uh, she had to put her hands back down into ready position. She couldn't just grab it. She, she has already learned that so much that we are not gonna be able to engage with the person in front of me in order to get that reward. I have to look unlike a child. <laughs> Like no child is like that. Like that's not realistic. Um, but we get back to that ready position. It's, um, but we see the intermittent reinforcement as well. And they do a ding every time that there's an intermittent reinforcement. This is meant to, there's a few things that happen with intermittent reinforcement. If you look at it in terms of uh, adult relationships, we have, a lot of information about how this is a form of abuse in adult relationships, but we don't consider it abuse with children for some reason, <laughs> and especially not autistic children yeah. because we're not humans. Uh, um, but this is like, um, it's in, meant to keep that engagement going because at some point you're gonna get that reward. And this is that insecure attachment style. That's the um, ambivalent one mm. where we're anxious. We know it's coming. We know we're gonna get that engagement, but we don't know when it is. But what this child has learned is that to get that, we have to get back to this position of this very unnatural body language to show that we are behaving. Yeah. Um, and that's a young child like this. I want to say that they said this video is of like five or six year old. And just to say that this video obviously was a reenactment and you purposely didn't show the video of real children because. It, We're not going to see that we don't, I don't think we need to see the distress in the child. Yeah. I don't think we need to experience that distress, especially since I know that um, autistic people are going to be here. Um, we don't need to see the distress that autistic yeah. kids are going through in these sessions. This is why I chose a reenactment. Also, I think it's unethical to be putting YouTubes up of children who can't consent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so reenactments are way better. Um, but we see this continuous reinforcement of things, whether it is the intentional reinforcement of requesting the goldfish, which then she had to go through and request again, even though she already requested it, which is like really backwards. Like, why would you be doing that? And then like, from their standpoint, they're like, oh, we're expanding language. No, you're withholding something that somebody's already asked for. This is that, or that is that ambivalent attachment of you're inconsistent. I can request something. I can advocate for what I want right now. And I'm not going to get it. And then I need to figure out what it is that you want. This is why we get anxious. <laughs> you have to figure out what the other person wants in order to get that need met, that want met. Right. I can't tell there if it's if there was a hunger there or if it was just, oh, I think I should have a goldfish right now. <laughs> yeah. And just the frustration alone that it would cause to know that sometimes you might be listened to and sometimes you won't and that you have to work harder when the when the when the child was you know going for the toy that they wanted and then it was withheld and it's still being withheld unless they do the thing that the adult asked it's a very it's a very uncomfortable power dynamic that it's is being exploited and it, it is, and it doesn't, it creates this sense that I have to wait until I please someone else before I can get something that I communicated 
very effectively. Right. And I think this, just to say quickly, and then you go, but there's this, this sense that kids have to become something else in order to be accepted and responded to. And I mean, that's really kind of at the heart of being securely attached, right? That, that you, exactly. you're, you're responded to and accepted for as you are now and always, as opposed to if you do this thing that I want you to do, then I will respond to you. Exactly. And now I am sure that somebody, if they watch this, is going to say, well, that's true of all kids. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that yeah. is, that is true. This, this is a problem with the way that we have come to decide that children's desires are not worthy. And now that does not mean that we need to attend to a child's needs instantaneously. Right. That's not what this is about. This is about controlling that situation for no other reason than to get what you want from that child. Of course, there's gonna be instances where you're feeding another child and your, your autistic kid wants you to open something and you can't do the two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we're, we shouldn't be making contrived right. moments contrived to work on this. Yeah. Because all we have to do is give me five minutes to finish this. You can ask your dad, you can ask your older brother, you can ask your older sister, your older sibling of some sort. You have other options than to do this. Or maybe we even use this as a situation where we're teaching how to open something that we can verbally talk about with the child while we're doing the other activity. All you have to do is pinch these two and pull it. See if you can do that. And then so, so like these moments that we are trying to get around a behavior happening. We're, we don't want to do this through the contrived notion that we have to ask a certain way. Also, then if they ask that certain way and they still don't get the, what they want, then it even more um, creates this um, ambivalent attachment style. Mm -hmm. Because then it's like, well, I've done what you asked for and you're still not doing it. Why? Why is this happening? What do we need to do different? Well, sometimes there's nothing we need to do different. Sometimes it's the, the, the situation. Right. And, and like, if, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, you said before that even if, so even if at that point the, the child doesn't quote act out or have behaviors, you know, due to the frustration, they may instead be internalizing those feelings and thinking that they aren't good enough or they can't rely on this person, you know, like, like we're setting kids up for a lot of unhealthy thoughts and stress that would be completely avoided if we were looking at this from a different lens. And just one more thing to add is that this is, this is a problem with all kids and the way that many adults view kids as, you know, their perspectives, not necessarily being as important as, as they really should be. But this really becomes worse when autistic communication and interaction styles are different from neurotypical styles. So again, it's not only that the attachment is being degraded, but it's also the, the inherent traits of the autistic child that are perhaps not being supported um, or are being, you know, uh, implicitly viewed as not as good because it wasn't asked in the right way or, you know, they weren't doing it in the way that we are requiring. And this assumes, all that we're talking about, assumes that the child can even fawn in that situation. Mm -hmm. So what that a child can even be compliant. Like some right. people can't. 
Right. This is where we get into like it becomes even more distressing and we get more of the avoidant um, attachment styles because we can't even get to the point of having the inconsistent rewards. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have children that withdraw into themselves. So, yeah, so, so really there's, I mean, there are a lot of different ways that this plays out um, in the long term. So, and maybe before we go forward into the long term, let's just parse out because in, in a previous video that we had, I, you and I had talked about this before. Um, in the past, like you've talked about love bombing. So can you kind of tell people what that is and then how does that play out in autism therapies? Oh, okay, yes. Uh, so love bombing is when you, and again, we are going into um, to information that we have on trauma and adult relationships to, to you to have these words. And I use them intentionally because they're something that everyone can be made aware of and you can go and read more about it without it being about autism mm -hmm. and then see how it translates to autism. Um, uh, but like, okay, so there's this, this thing that uh, BCBA is like saying um, and don't see how bad it is, um, where the phrase is, you want to become the giver of all good things. And they think this is fantastic. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so this is love bombing. This is showering the child with praise, showering the child with what they like, showering the child with everything that is good and wholesome and great for the purpose of pairing yourself and becoming the person that becomes attached to the things that we get. Um, and this is an intentional thing that is done within behaviorist practices, but especially in ABA uh, clinical settings and in home settings. Mm -hmm. We don't see it nearly as much in education. Um, you can kind of see it sometimes with speech and OT um, before we get into this, let's do the work. And this is intentionally made to make your feel, child feel safe and secure with that person. Like it is the defining characteristic of love finding is that it's meant to make you feel that safety and security. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really fast way to get that. Um, and then that's how it becomes even more confusing when you stop doing the high love bombing and then get into the intermittent reinforcement because now you've created this impression that this is somebody that's really safe. And then we're going to code, we're, we're going to switch it up. And uh, uh, this happens especially uh, in ABA in, um, in Hanley, uh, Greg Hanley's uh, work. It is like what he says to do. Which is, <laughs> which is uh, trauma-informed ABA, right? This is, this is trauma-informed ABA. There is trauma-informed behavior analytic practices you can do. This is not it, <laughs> um, but this is what they call trauma-informed and this is what they call new ABA. And this isn't even like good ABA, this is new ABA, uh, where it is intentionally love bombing and not just love bombing, but also meeting all of those kids' needs. And you do this and you do this and you keep on doing this until you stop doing this. <laughs> And you make these contrived interactions to where the person has to wait for what they need. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes coercive. Well, you can get that once we do this. And it's an intentional talking to the kid about what they're going to get once they, they do what's asked. Um, it's so heavily coercive. Um, but it, 
then it makes it it becomes explicitly clear that yes, I have to do this to get what I want or what right. I need. Right. Um, Can I tell you two comments? Um, yes. One from Autumn says, if people are seeing a parallel between love bombing in an ABA context and in a domestic abuse context, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And Roy, Roya says, sounds like grooming, frankly. Yes. Yes. Um, and what we know is that grooming by itself is abuse. Even if you don't go on to do any other forms of abuse after that, grooming itself is abuse and the ways it destroys your sense of self is innate to grooming. And that that is the underpinning of all behaviorists, behaviorism is this quid pro quo to get Mm-hmm. behavior it's all, it's all transactional yes and so so this is known about grooming um throughout all other fields i imagine um but again this is like this is another overlooked aspect of quote autism therapies that that kids are being put through you know for tens of hours a week um, whether at home or in school. Um, and let's, let's say too, that, you know, because this is how society operates around autism and disability, especially, um, there are many parents, we've talked about this more recently, how there's really not much choice or they, you know, they, they have to send their kids, um, to places, that you know do these sorts of things knowing that it's not aligned you know with best practice and you know even mental health or um attachment so um i know you kind of mentioned this before with the other question but do you think too that d- does does that tension maybe also impact the attachment in some way because of the distress, it's also causing for that parent. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of aspects here. There's a there's a lot of layers of. There of is, and uh, and then uh, I, I I want to make sure to bring in the intersectionality that can can happen as well, like as a queer parent, as a trans parent, as a BIPOC parent, as um, a family that uses Medicaid and like all of that, the likeliness that we are told we have to do things a different way or else child services is gonna end up at your door. And like, it happens to me every couple of years. Wow. <laughs> to, be re- to like be very realistic here. It happens to me every couple of years that if I'm not doing the behaviorist way, I'm going to have child protective services at my door. Now I have a protocol to explain like what we're doing and how we're doing it so that they understand. But like, I have to do that every couple of years. Um, (laughs) uh, So we have to look at the intersectionality of like what happens because um, if you go into a school situation, if you don't understand like why you're not doing these things and you're anything but middle-class white, Mm then the likeness is that you're going to um, bump up against a lot of systems of oppression and not just that disability. And so then that makes um, this anxious um, attachment style in the parent with the kid. Yeah. And that creates a whole new layer to all of these problems because now you're anxious about what you should be doing and how you should be reacting because you don't want to be punished yourself. And it's why I try to be as kind and understanding of parents that are going through all of the process because again, if you're not middle-class white, you may not be able to stand up and speak up for your kids in a way that you, that everyone else gets the luxury of. Wow. 
do you, so is there any way to tackle that problem right now? I mean, it's, uh, this is how we, this is why we need to advocate for specific interventions that educators can use. This is why I don't like the autistic rally cry that we don't need to do anything. That's not reality. Mm -hmm. And it can get kids taken away from the parents mm -hmm. and then put into these systems at a much higher rate. Um, so going in, knowing that you can request collaborative and proactive solutions as the methodology to do the behavior control. Right. Um, yes, it's hard to get in, but at least you have something that you can point to and say, this is evidence-based practice. Yeah. Um, you can go in and look at, or there's a, a goodness, what is the name of uh, the um, crisis intervention that does not do restraint and seclusion? Um, there's a specific one. Oh. Um, that looks at blocking and all these other forms of being able to manage that crisis situation. Going in and asking for that specific training. And so you have to learn about the specific training that can be done in a school that have has been done in schools. And honestly, if you look at guidance from, um, from the US Department of Education, these are usually what they recommend. They don't, they don't even recommend restraint and seclusion anymore in their guidance but like it's not a law so like right and everyone still you know, as we all know there are powerful industries involved at all levels and so you know that uh ends up feeding into this whole thing i mean what you said should stop every person in their tracks it is disgusting that people with less privilege because of this type of society that we live in would need to worry that their children will be taken away merely for following their values and trying to be responsive to their autistic children. And we need to ask ourselves why that is, why is it? Um, I mean, I, I, I am aware of this. I'm sure many of us are aware of that. It doesn't make it any easier to stomach. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think though, that this is why all of you do what you do because you have to, I mean. <laughs> I'll be real. When I started doing autism activism, autistic activism, it was, it was not about everyone else. It was about my kids mm -hmm. and they're going to be eight, 17 and 18 in April. <laughs> like they're about to be grown. Yeah. And I did not change the system. Like I wanted to, <laughs> like, uh, I was way too late by the time that I got enough knowledge to really affect change in their education. And that's horrible to feel. Um, but it's also a burden that you shouldn't have. Yeah. But like, I know historically why it's happened. Yeah. Because autistic people didn't start even speaking up until I was 12 years old. Mm. Like 1994 is when we really started seeing a rise in autistic voices in any space. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about less than 30 years ago. That's not fast enough to, or that's not long enough to make change that had been going on like societally since the mid 19th century. Right. Um, we just haven't had enough time. Yeah. And again, I think that for those listening who are not autistic, um, like we need to try really hard not to take these criticisms personally or um, 
you know, to shut them down because they might not agree with how we think because we're, we don't belong to your group. And so we don't know what it's like to, to be autistic, to grow up in a society that devalues being autistic. And, 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 you know, even if our systems were designed to quote help, uh, like last week we had, um, Sue Fletcher Watson and, and, and her talking about her research and how autism research needs to really pivot is like, how do you ensure that you're constantly evolving to make sure that you're, what you're doing is aligned with what the autistic community wants and needs. And so, so it's like continually pushing yourself to, to question and be open to the feedback from the community that you're setting out, you know, to work with and, and to help. I think that kind of gets back to the question one, right? Where we're talking about everyone thinks the goal should be these skills mm -hmm. that somebody can do when they're an adult. But we all know that that's not quality. That's not the life that most of us want to live. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this also has implications within like social skills training and all of this that I could go on another hour about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what do you see as like the long-term concerns and problems with an insecure attachment. Um, How does that look in adulthood? When we're anxious all the time, like autistic people, even without like discrete behaviorism and just general behaviorism that comes with like our society. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why we have such a high rate of anxiety because we can't get our needs met. And we know what those needs are. Like autistic people know what these needs are. Yeah. We wanna get our sensory needs met. We wanna get our executive functioning needs met. We wanna be able to do our ADLs or at least have ADLs exist even if we're not doing it. I also think about it in terms of like um, service provision as adults. I don't know if anyone is aware of this, but like uh, as you, when you become an adult, if you are on Medicaid, if like you transition into adulthood with Medicaid, you can get personal care attendant services with Medicaid without an HCS or class waiver. Like it is part of your Medicaid package. Mm -hmm. But you can only get that if you can't do your ADLs. <laughs> so if you can't do them at all? No, if you need support getting them done. So like if you need somebody to initiate your task for you, you can get a PCA for that. If you can't sequence it, you can get a PCA that helps you sequence doing your chores. You don't actually have to learn those skills. Okay. For adult service acquisition services. <laughs> um, so we're teaching autistic kids the, through this terrible thing where we're teaching them that they, the only thing they can do is what is being told of them to get their reward for a skill they don't even need when they get to be a, an adult. If they are continuing, if they continue to need services as an adult, this is the one thing that you can actually get. Wow. <laughs> and wouldn't, I mean, so isn't it more important that if you didn't like the service provider that you had, that you could say, no, thanks. I want someone else. That's way more important. Yeah. But we're not going to teach that. Like this is not, this is not the way that services are set up um, until the age of 18 for autistic kids. We, and so we get a bunch of people that have no goals in life or have the most basic of goals. Mm -hmm. Like the goals that we all set up, uh, having a place to live, having a place to go during the day, eating, 
So survival, like you said. Yeah. Like these are the goals. And like, no, and so of course we're going to be depressed mm -hmm. because we have no purpose. And we've had all of our favorite things held hostage for so long. Let's be real. When we get, when autistic kids become adults and they don't have that structure around them anymore, or worse, they have that structure around them all the time because the parents haven't like learned that they need to be autonomous. Mm -hmm. uh, end up binging on their interest. How many times have we heard a parent of an adult autistic say, I don't know how many of you engage with, with parents with a, a, um, autistic adult offspring, um, but they never do anything but play games. They're not even trying to get a job. They're not trying to get friends. Mm -hmm. It's because we have made it to where the only thing that they can do is work towards what they want to do, which is the thing that we've held hostage for so long. <laughs> That's a depressing life. Yeah. Or maybe a very joyous filled life if it's not everyone nagging you to stop doing it. Like maybe that's really what they want. And like, that's great. And like, you can engage with, you, with what you want and you can like have your basic needs met. I actually don't have a problem with that being an outcome. Mm -hmm. If because it's a person's it, choice. Yes. But then the message around that is you're not good enough because the only thing you're doing is the one thing you want to do. Right. And, you know, um, the other thing is that when we're constantly trying to redirect people to do the things that we want them to do, we're preventing them from not only doing the things that they want to do, but maybe there are things that they could do in the long term based on you know their interest or whatever it is that they like and we're preventing them from developing you know skills or you know like we're with we're kind of preventing opportunities by redirecting them to what we think is better it's it's very value based it is and but the end result is also you're not doing what I want you to as an adult. And what does this lead to? Well, one, it leads to guardianship a lot. <laughs> Instead of somebody being able to make their own choices about their money, about where they live, about what they do with their day, we end up getting day hack programs and yeah and group homes instead of integrated uh, natural living situations where you can still get the same services, but uh, they tend to be a little bit more person directed and you have to kind of know what you want in order to be able to be in that kind of environment. And um, unfortunately, most um, Autistic people don't even know what they want past their interest because we haven't had that exploration um, into what we want. Yeah. And do you but, feel like a lot? Do you feel like a lot of um, possibilities also are stifled because of the lack of accessibility in general? Oh yeah. Um, Oh yeah, like uh, we have an 80% uh, unemployment or underemployment, I think, rate for autistic college grads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so like, even if you get to that point, um, if you're not doing things in the expected way, yeah, if we're ending up with, we can't do anything. And so then that internalized, I am the problem. Uh, and I'd be lying if I didn't said, I don't feel that way sometimes. Yeah. 
Like I can't hold a regular job. I like what I do, but like sometimes it would be easier if I could hold a regular job to survive and take care of my family, but I yeah. can't. And so it's every day working on that acceptance of yourself. But if you've never been exposed to be able to accept yourself, if all you've ever had is this programming where everyone says it's a quid pro quo, you do this and we give you this. Right. Um, right. So your worth is determined on what you do and how you do it, which again, people will argue, well, that's, you know, how it's not. people have jobs too, but no, because this is, this is about every aspect of your life being conditioned in this fashion. Uh, several years ago, I presented at Autism Society um, National Conference on Executive Functioning. And at the end, we had a and a and this mom stands up and says, well, how do you get them to do this if they don't want to? And the only way I, the only way I can get my 29-year-old son to do his chores in his own home is if I promise him another video game. Well, I can't help you because that's a lot of things to work through. That's like, yeah. <laughs> that's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about creating supports around executive functioning so that somebody can, can live. But I'm not going to make that motivation suddenly happen because he's 29 and you're still giving him a reward for cleaning his room. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I'm over-exaggerating here <laughs> because it was a whole apartment. <laughs> You're not going to change that at that point. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be up to that person to like know, hey, I need to have a clean home. Right. But right. Also, yeah. there was PCAs coming in that could clean the home. So like, okay, does he really need it to do it himself? Uh, right. Okay. And so, again, the question is not only um, are we degrading attachment are we like stifling, you know, intrinsic motivation? Um, are we um, making it so that we're not like honoring that particular child's way of communicating? But also, like you just said, is this specific goal even important and meaningful for that person? And really like, isn't that kind of the first question that should be <laughs> Asked to be it should be. I mean, I am sure that every single mom that is watching this would love to have a housekeeper come in and just clean their home every week. Mm -hmm. Like everyone would just love that. That that would be perfect. Yeah, because we don't want to do it either. Now we can't afford. M many of us cannot afford that luxury. <laughs> right. But rich people get to do it all the time. <laughs> Literally. All yeah. the time. <laughs> no questions asked. Like, you know, it's just normal. That's what people well, do. I, and yeah, I, I definitely know people that they have a housekeeper as a stay at home mom mm -hmm. because they have the money to, and they would rather be filling that with something else other than cleaning their home. Right. And so I'm not going to shame them for that. Like, everyone would love that. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a moral judgment if you want somebody else to clean your home. <laughs> yeah, but somehow it is for an autistic adult. But we're also not allowing, even for that space, to learn. Hey, how can I set up a um, a plan to do this? Because so far, all I've ever been taught is. I do the thing, I get the thing. There's no problem solving on how to get from point A to point B. Right. It's here's what you get, here's the reward. And now it's just waiting for that next one. Which right. is, is how and, we get into the insecure attachment. And so that, that again is a good example of how we can miss the actual thing that needs to happen, which is, 
if you're, if you are coming at this from, well, we just have to motivate them, you know, and Alfie Cohn would talk about the extrinsic motivator, you know, you're assuming there is no intrinsic motivation. And so you're saying, well, this is just a problem of motivation, but the actual problem, maybe it is a little bit of motivation, but maybe it's also executive functioning or sensory or, you know, any number of these that have not been addressed. These are the needs that we're not meeting. Like this is like the, the literal part of attachment is getting your needs met. Yeah. Yes. And we haven't even figured out what the need is. Right. So then how could we possibly meet them? And so you're going to automatically create a insecure attachment if we're not even looking at what the needs are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this has uh, other, so I'm talking about it in the sense of somebody that needs continuous support, but the way it c- turns out with people that don't need that, who maybe are a little bit more self-sufficient is in our relationships. And that's even worse because now we are, setting people up for higher rates of domestic violence because, hey, this person is giving me everything that I want. This is how relationships work Mm -hmm. because we've literally taught people from the time that they are two years old that this is how all relationships work. Parenting relationships, peer relationships, because we get into these social skills where we have buddy Yeah. Yeah. Teachers, everyone is using these same methods over and over. You do this for me. I do this for you. And it creates this idea that these, this is the way relationships are based. Wow. So that's friendships. That's intimate relationships. That's a job. Yeah. And so we, and it's not only getting, it's not only having to perform and then getting things, but it's also this person can have you do whatever they want you to, and they can withhold or treat you the way they think you should be treated, regardless of whether it's ethical. Yeah. And there's more than enough people that are willing to exploit that. So let's just, let's just say this one more time. So going from, from an early childhood of every relationship you have is transactional. And even if some of them are, you're still, you're still kind of creating this, you know, mindset of this is how most of my relationships are. And this is how most people act and, and treat me when it comes time for adulthood, you are not going to be able to advocate for healthy relationships for yourself. You're not going to know to. Yeah. It's not even, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to know to, because that is the way life has been. I mean, that is a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? I mean, uh, for all of you, it probably is, but I, it's experience. Yeah. It's my lived experience. And it's many autistic people's lived experience. So for all of you who have had to live through this and figure out how to push through it. Um, like, what do you, what do you want to say to professionals who think they have good intentions? I'm sure they are good intentioned, but like, what, what do you want people to really know? Um, both parents too, because, you know, they're making decisions early on and have to wade through a lot of 
information too, but. Um, For me, it's about thinking about what you want out of your life. Like baseline, I want my needs met. I want to be happy. I want to be secure in my relationships. What do I do to get there? Mm -hmm. What do I do to get my kid there? Because that's the entire point of parenting, entire point of education. Or at least it's supposed to be. I'm not going to say the education system because that is actually not the intention of the education system. <laughs> but like education itself is supposed to be about getting to that point of being happy, healthy as much as possible because none of us are healthy as autistic adults um, way too much in terms of like all the body. Yeah. Uh, was it the body keeps the score? Um, yes. Right. And so again, that's like well known in the trauma research that our bodies hold on to stress, that even if we don't have memories of these early experiences, our bodies remember. I mean, it's incredibly. There's a reason there's a high, like chronic pain, autism thing. Yeah. I guess it's a well-known thing among the autistic community. Yeah. Because our body is, has had to learn to constantly be in a panic state. Because this attachment is about panic states. Mm -hmm. If we don't feel safe, we're never going to get back into this up here. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So this is a lot. Um, let me, Sorry, I always do no, that to you. <laughs> no, I know, but I think it's absolutely necessary because we're never going to be able to figure this out if we don't talk about it out in the open and, and make ourselves uncomfortable. I mean, I hate that you and others have to talk about these painful things and, and like put yourselves through that. Um, I know like I'm incredibly grateful for your willingness to even do that because I mean, you're, it, I, will I say hope, that there's I a hope a lot of depersonalizing it. It's why I talk about it in yeah. Clinical terms. Yeah. Because depersonalized, I don't have to, there, there's obviously moments where I talk about my personal experience and I'm feeling that, but like, that's why I talk about things in a very depersonalized way is because that's the way to talk about it and keep myself safe. <laughs> yeah. And still get the message out about it. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, appreciate you so much. Um, can you, this is like a, a sort of a random, um, side road I'll take here, but can we just go back so that, um, Rachel Frank had asked if you could recap needs like sensory executive functioning. Okay. So, and this is going to go into, um, foundations for divergent minds. Um, my divergent mind framework that we have created, um, the five areas that we specifically target, well, technically six, and we'll, I'll talk about why six, but like five in the person is sensory integration. Um, so like all eight sensory areas, uh, auditory, visual, olfactory, um, tactile. Why am I using all the technical words? <laughs> 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 um, uh, gustatory, since I've already started on this path. <laughs> Um, gustatory is your, your taste buds, um, that we don't usually use that word. Um, we have proprioceptive vestibular and interoception and a lot of the interoception is, there is some talk amongst the autistic community about whether or not that is actually, um, a dissociative state, um, a partial dissociative state. Um, if we can't tell that we're hungry or need to use the bathroom and all these things, and then we're told not to react to it, does our brain just shut off those sensations? Um, 
And I'm going to, I want to make this, I make the assumption that probably yes, because we see this a lot with um, people with uh, food insecurity growing up, how you either get to where you constantly are aware of how hungry you are, or you're constantly unaware of how hungry you are. Like that's mm -hmm. something we know from that trauma kind of work. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make the assumption that autistic people are correct in, in their assumptions that this is maybe a dissociative state. Um, okay, so then the second area is executive functioning, and there's eight executive functioning traits, uh, initiation, shift, inhibition, working memory, planning, organization, self-monitoring, and emotional regulation. <laughs> okay, uh, then when we get into the next part is communication, and so we're not just talking about um, expressive and um, and we're, we're talking about expressive and receptive communication and how, but we need to keep in mind that those also have ties into your sensory things and into your executive functioning of being able to plan your speech and plan your motor movements and all these things that come with, with expressive communication. Um, but it also talks about body language and, uh, and a little bit about pragmatic. Um, and so we want to focus, we have things that we want to be able to focus on just with communication. And then uh, social interaction is the next part of our, um, of our buildup um, of our framework. And that looks at the ways that we want to be able to work on self-advocacy skills, um, not just to get your needs met, but also just to have engagement within peers and uh, also gets into like our special interests. I hate the, that term, I hate special interests, uh, <laughs> but they're just interests. Um, our ability to focus has nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, that is executive functioning. <laughs> um, but uh, so uh, it also gets into double empathy problem of like recognizing that the ways that we interpret um, body language and other people and our experience and how that shapes the way that we have social experiences um, is different from a neurotypical one and making sure that we're honoring that as a natural part of development because um, we get into the research on what masking does um, yeah. in sense of self and why not. And then the last piece that we focus on for the self is the emotional regulation piece um, and recognizing that um, we need to be able to do like grounding exercise and that sort of thing to be able to even tell where we're at because uh, we tend to be a little unable to recognize our emotions. And again, this could be a trauma response. We're not, I'm not entirely sure um, if it's also that same dissociative or if it's maybe just not having those emotions labeled because we're not expressing them the same way, but also looking at how we need to support all the other areas so that we can prevent dysregulation. Yeah. Not always, but like, if we can, we should. Yeah. And then the sixth layer is the neurodiversity, which is an external thing. So it's um, everyone around the person being able to accept that this person is has communicative intent with with their behaviors like there's um there's a reason for it this is uh behaviors communication this is um also our presuming competence and all these buzzwords that we hear with neurodiversity that is the um looking at the societal and the um attitudinal barriers that come into play um that then make the mismatch between what we want and what we get. Yeah. Yeah. It's all so good. Um, and I'm so glad that you're all going to come back in April and like talk to us more about FDM. Um, I know like I personally feel that hearing from autistic adults, um, I don't know how to say this, but, but it, it kind of, um, cleared a lot of the clouds away for me, um, like early on, especially because if the only filter that you're getting information on how to help autistic kids is through non-autistic people, it's going to be inherently biased. Um, <laughs> and it's not just inherently biased. It sounds by design. 
Mm. It's made to look and sound good. Like when we talk about grooming and love bombing and all these things that we're doing, yeah, that's by design that your kid is happy. That's literally what that process is supposed to do is to keep that, um, keep it until we don't get what we want. This is how we get the ambivalent attachment is like, yes, we feel great, but now we're anxious because we don't know what we want. But if we're being rewarded for not, be, not reacting, we're going to learn that that is what we need to do all the time. But we're still going to be happy that person's going to come to the door because we're still going to get the things we want. Yeah. And don't you think too, that some of this, I mean, I, it's kind of set out in the open. I know as a parent, I've heard these things that, um, parents are also sort of targeted. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't wait to read, uh, this book. Um, the autism industrial complex. Yes. Like I, I started the first chapter last night and like, I should probably not read this right now because I <laughs> am talking tomorrow <laughs> and I don't want to have that heavy negative influence in my head because I already have enough of that yeah. before coming into here, because this is a heavy subject to talk yeah. about it from the forms of what we're doing to a person. Yeah. Um, I'll say too, so we will have more, um, we'll have another NJA's webinar um, with Alicia Broderick, who's the author and scholar of that book. Um, that'll be April 1st. And um, for those who are parents who are watching, um, we recently had disability scholar Priya Lalvani, who has a book called Constructing the Mother. Um, and it also goes into sort of this history of um, first, like in order to get to the disabled person, you first have to break down the mother. Um, and, and, and there's, there's actually a, a history, like a documented history. It goes into, you know, eugenics, um, like forcible sterilization. People used to think that if someone had like a disabled child that, you know, the parents must've upset the gods. Like there's a whole history of sort of this like blame on parents, which then transferred to the mother in the refrigerator mother's. Um, I need to pause you okay? because this is a cultural problem too. Yeah. Because this is not universal. This is not, has never, this is a Western culture idea. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have to spotlight that because we see it there as more and more indigenous autistic people come out and talk, we can see that this doesn't necessarily happen in our communities. Yeah. We are seeing more and more of it in African communities because it was imported. Like this is the effect of colonization. Um, and so again, a whole other subject. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great point. Um, so <laughs> really think about that when you were, when we're thinking about this, because then we can see why it's so bad that, uh, these methods are being pushed into developing countries. Yes. Wow. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Did I go too deep? <laughs> no, I think it's good. Um, it just, it gives us a lot to ponder and, and. Think about I clearly it. just think about these things because you say something and then like the next pop, thought pops yeah. into my head of like, let's look at the systemically as well. Like we can't just look at it from the personal. It has to be looked at at all these levels. Exactly. Like none of this is happening in a vacuum. It's all happening in the context of the human experience and our cultural, you know, interactions. Um, let me just see. Someone, so, oh, and uh, someone was asking for the titles. Oh, uh, to Amy. So the title of the one talk was, um, Joe, maybe, Joe, can you post the um, Priya's uh, first talk and also the link? I don't know if we have the link ready for April 1st yet, but it'll be there. So we'll post that in a second. Um, 
I just wanted to say that people are so grateful for this Oswin and like everyone is, you know, just. Will I be able to see the comments on the video after? You will, yes, okay. you will. Um, one theme I am noticing a little though, is that I think now some of the parents are feeling a little scared. I am sorry, parents. Uh, I, I really, really understand. Uh, like I was telling Jen before we came on, I have an IEP meeting tomorrow for my daughter. And like, I, it is a continuation because we're trying to, I'm trying to get every bit of like behaviors practices out of her IEP, which is hard. It is really hard. Yeah. And I'm not going to deny how hard that is because it is, is extremely hard. With my oldest, I was never successful. In getting it all taken out. Yeah. I tried. I tried so hard, but I couldn't do it. And so he and I have had to have talks about how the education system has failed him and what we're going to do to try and help him going forward into adulthood because I couldn't do that. And that's scary to hear too, mm -hmm. but know that that, that, that fear is reasonable yeah and I I want to validate that because like I can't stop it I can't make you feel better because our reality does not allow for it but know that what you do with your kids matters mm -hmm. even if you can't get everyone else on board what you do matters what you choose for your child matters. And yeah. so you can do all the things you can away from the school environment to give that safety and security. So even if they're going into school in anxious mesh, knowing they can come home and be safe is incredibly important for them. And yeah. that, if that's the only thing you can focus on, then that's the only thing you can focus on. And try to be kind to yourself that you can't do more than that. Yeah. I think that's good advice. And we just, we just love our kids for who they are as, as much as we can. And, you know, yeah. um, yes. And Amy said, uh, well, a couple of people are talking about, you know, the lack of empathy um, and, you know, and the importance of, of hearing from disabled adults um, that like, it's absolutely crucial for like, for those of us who are not autistic or disabled, we will never have the same experience, even as parents, even if we both parent autistic kids, like I'll never know what it's like to be autistic. So, you know, it's the only way that you can better understand that is by listening and, and listening with an open mind. Um, and keep in mind that the majority of people who are interacting with our kids are also not autistic. Yeah. And also trying to remember that most of them are also doing what they think is right. Yes. So the more we can come with evidence of a different way being good, yeah, the better it is. Coming in with an oppositional um, stance, you have to learn how to show what you believe and not argue against. Yeah. What that, they're saying. Yeah. Because then you get into defensiveness and then they don't feel safe. And so like this even goes into that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. People need to see the alternatives and. And, and the alternatives work. Yeah. And we know the alternatives work. It sounds like they're not going to work because we've been 
collectively told that you have to do punishment and reward to be able to get what you want out of a child. Yeah. Um, but the other ways work too. My cross screen says a child will do better if they can do. Right. I, I put it the wrong direction, but you know what I mean. Okay. <laughs> Kids do well if they can. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I tried, but sometimes those words are hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, to moon and back mommy, it's collaborative, proactive solutions. Yes. Um, it's by Ross Green. Um, someone else was saying that 20% of punishments go to um, people of color who are disabled people of color. Um, and that, let me see here. So Amy Breton says, I also extract data and analyze it. 20% of punishments go to disabled people of color. Black kids here are only 2%. How could that be? But I think you no. sort of touched on this <laughs> yes. a little bit before that. I mean, there's also a great deal of research on um, like societal implicit bias. Like we know that young children will identify the black doll as the deviant one and the yeah. white one is not. Um, we know that uh, black boys uh, are considered to be older and more mature and so even from like a four-year-old age, um, expected to be able to do, uh, to not, uh, are thought to be older and more mature and need to like not be so oppositional. And like we put these moral judgments on typical child behavior just because of race. And so you put that together with somebody that actually can't get their needs met yeah. and actually needs a different, um, support system and yeah. of course you're going to end up with the worst case scenario which is why so many uh BIPOC parents are so concerned about police intervention because it's going to happen mm -hmm. I know it's happened with my oldest wow um so um it is something that we have to worry about, which is why I try to be very, very understanding. If a parent can't change what's happening in school, at least do it at home. Yeah. Well, I think that's um, a good note to end on. Um, there's obviously so much more that we could talk about, but I'm really glad that you're coming back in April um, yes. and we can definitely expand on <laughs> a number all of the things. things. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for watching today. Um, again, you can go to the Foundation for Divergent Minds website. They also have a Facebook page. Anything else you wanted to share, Osman? Um, I also have my professional page for anybody that's not, that wants specific to ABA stuff. We don't do, or FDM does not do anything specific to ABA. So I do that consulting work on the side. Okay. So, if you're a BCBA and you're listening, I do offer consulting services to help you. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very nice. Um, okay. So uh, that's it for us today then. Um, Joe shared um, the previous webinar we had with Dr. Lavani. Um, she had done a second on inclusion in schools, by the way, and our education systems. Um, and um, thank you everybody for watching. Uh, I think we're not going to be back now for a couple of weeks, but we'll be sharing some previews and clips of this webinar. And thank you again, Osman, you bring so much to every conversation we have and we're really grateful. Thank you. I, I'm glad I was able to do this. Same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs>